afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. As we kick off a new week on Across the Fence, it's time to check on our gardens and landscapes. Our experts are here to provide us with seasonal tips and to help us understand pests or other problems that might be showing up. It's a pleasure to welcome back two frequent contributors from the University of Vermont, Leonard Perry and Anne Hazelrig. Thanks so much for coming in now. You. Leonard, you're going to start with a question from one of our viewers who asked about cacti. Cacti, believe it or not, and we're not talking house plants. We're talking well, actually, we are talking houseplants, not the outdoor. There are a couple of outdoor ones, a Puntia's one that mm -hmm. actually will bloom in overwinter. It's a hardy cactus. But uh, this uh, Mary Forrest wrote in, thank you, Mary, for writing about indoor cacti and says, I love cacti, have no problem growing them, but how do you get them to blossom? I'm not talking about Christmas or Thanksgiving cacti, but other cacti. I was told maybe it's because I put them outside in the summer. Um, probably not. I mean, um, you can put them out in the summer and give them more light, but light is one of the keys. And you know, these grow in the desert and it's, we're not in the desert and they, they don't get the, that kind of light. So it's really hard. A lot of times greenhouses have that light. Mm -hmm. Here's a, one of my favorites called Bishop's Cap Cactus. It doesn't have those nasty thorns. It, it yeah, looks kind of nice. like a Bishop's Cat and that is a, a bloom on it. But this was taken at a botanic garden, which has the highlight in it. So highlights one, but there are a couple of other factors too. Um, in the winter time, they like to be cool and dry. So full sun, highlight, put them in a very bright window, brightest you have. Um, um, cool and dry, about 50 degrees, and maybe water once a month at most. And some of them, you have to be older in order to bloom too, so the age oh, could kidding. be a factor. All right. Well, thanks to Mary for sending along that question. If you have any questions for our experts, send them along. We'll try to answer them on a future program. Now, Leonard, you usually bring in some beautiful <coughs> flowers. I guess last month um, you had some cone flowers, but this time you have some that don't look so great. I have a couple of sick cone flowers. <laughs> I uh, thought Anne would have liked these too. Um, but these, this is a problem with some now. There's so many cone flowers out there mm -hmm. They're, um, in Echinaceas. And up here in the back is one called Milkshake. And these are kind of, you know, it's late in the season going by, but it should be white with more of a cone in the center. Um, this is what the flower looks like. I mean, it's just all nasty. There are no white uh, petals on the outside, and, and that's uh, what happens here. This one is one called Ruby Giant. It's one of uh, the better ones in my trials. A very nice, pretty cone in the center here, but you can see what's happened here. That cone gets all disformed and, uh, and mottled, and it's, um, it could be one of two things. It could be a very microscopic mite called a cone flower rosette mite. A experts don't know too much about that yet. It's kind of a new problem or a problem. Aster yellows gets on a lot of uh, flowers. Uh, they originally thought it's a virus. It's a virus-like uh, organism called a phytoplasma, but it's very small. And the problem is with that, you can't do much. You have to rogue out the plants. These two, the plants that have that, and we'll have to yank them out. Oh, really? Just destroy them. If it is the mite, you can cut them back in the fall, destroy that, and it'll get rid of the mite probably. So you could try that. If it comes back next year, get rid of the plants. So. <laughs> unfortunately, and try to look for the healthy plants without that when you're buying them too. Right, really, yeah. Okay, so you have some other plants that look much better. I, I do. I did bring, a, I had to bring a nice <laughs> looking one too, and this is actually a, a Rudbeckia. It's called Henry Eilers, E-I-L-E-E-R-S, named after a nurseryman mm -hmm. of that name, who in 2003 in Illinois found this in a uh, prairie remnant along railways. Um, that's where a lot of the prairies are left in the Midwest, because the rest is agriculture now, but he found this, and you, you notice the flower, these are the, what the flowers look like. They're very uh, fine. They're kind of quilled, they're called. They're kind of like a tube that flares out at the end. Yeah, it's not so much a petal. It's more yeah, a some of the chrysanthemums have that too, quilled flowers. And uh, this gets about five feet high and five to eight feet wide. Now, the problem I found with it, it tends to flop. Right. You know, it really needs staking. But there's a new one. Of course, breeders come out with it, <laughs> selected a new one called Little Henry. So if you want one that's a bit shorter and, and tends not to flop, look for Little Henry. But Henry Isle a great cone flower, beautiful flowers, very different flowers, a great cut flower too. All right, let's turn to Ann who has the UVM Plant Diagnostic Clinic. What are you seeing or dealing with this summer? Well, um, just overall diseases have been lower this summer because it's been so hot and dry. So that's been a nice thing. We still don't see, and we don't have any late blight uh, in Vermont on potatoes or tomatoes. And last year that was a big problem. Yeah, past several years it's been a big problem and it's not even really in New England yet. So that's the good news. Um, I am getting some questions about this uh, insect that I brought a picture of. Um, and this is called a, this is a green stink bug nymph. And several years ago we had a real outbreak of these. These 
uh, green bugs. You, I've got the next picture uh, shows the adult of the uh, insect. And uh, gardeners were calling from all over. And we had this big green stink bug adult. Oh, that's the nymph. That's the immature. So the next picture should be the adult. Um, yeah, there's the adult. And it's really a neat looking insect. Um, and people notice it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it does cause some damage. It's got a piercing, sucking mouth part. So it, when it feeds, it causes dimples on lots of different fruits and vegetables. So it can cause some damage. But usually it's more of a curiosity for gardeners because it's a big, green, bright Now, it's called bug. a stink bug. Does that mean that if you yeah, I guess step if you, on it? Yeah, I think so. I've never tried that. I don't really yeah. want to know. <laughs> but I'm I'll just read it. Yeah, I'll just trust the literature. <laughs> and you have a couple more pictures, too, that you want to talk about? Yeah, this is another uh, pest. I brought a caterpillar that uh, is it's a big guy. It's really an impressive caterpillar when you see it. These can be up to four inches long. Ew. Yeah, they're the size of a small puppy, I think. <laughs> um, but it's a... Uh, can't the, miss it. No, you can't. Well, they, they hide really well in tomato plants. So it's called the tomato hornworm. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was the mild winter we had, but these are really prevalent this year. And what gardeners notice first is just stems of tomatoes missing all the foliage. Really? So, and then when you see that, then you should look deeper in your plant for this camouflaged insect. So what, do they the, hang out under the leaves or something? Yeah, or? I, yeah they're just really hard to see. Mm. Um, but the next slide I brought uh, is uh, a picture of one of those tomato hornworms. And if you see this in your garden, this is really cool. This is a wasp uh, oh. that has parasitized this caterpillar. The wasp lays its egg on the caterpillar the larvae feed inside, um, and then they pupate. These are the pupae of the wasps on the back. So if you see that in your garden, leave those tomato hornworms. Don't control those because that'll allow that wasp to complete its life cycle. And they, um, So a natural know. remedy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Otherwise, you know, Gardeners can hand pick these, and I can't squish <laughs> them. They're too big. <laughs> but I use tongs. <laughs> I just throw them, and I assume they can't make the 30 <laughs> feet back. <laughs> now, Leonard, you've got a couple of other plants, and unfortunately, there are things that you don't want on your property. Right. Uh, again, a couple things you don't want here. We'll start with this uh, uh, kind of twiggy one here. It's called a buckthorn. We'll turn it around so you can see these little black berries that it makes. And yeah. birds love those, and they eat those and then they spread them all around and so I have these coming up in lilacs and along with rose beds and, and all over the place and these can uh, it's, it's a very uh, invasive plant very tough um, you really need to get that out and start cutting it out when it comes in and then it makes this sucker shoot so it start, has these little leaves if it's a, like a bush or a small tree um, but then you know these big shoots come out with the bigger leaves so anyway buckthorn is one to definitely watch out for and get out this this is one that um, came from Europe originally and it's all around now. It's a uh, nightshade. It's the bittersweet nightshade. It's not the deadly one, which is Good. pretty rare, but it is can be fatal if eaten in large quantities. Usually won't. Um, maybe kids might. I know when our daughter was small, she we thought she'd gotten into some berries, so we rushed her in to the you know hospital and had the treatments and stuff. She turns out she hadn't really, but um, uh, if a kid gets these and eats a lot, the green unripe berries are a lot more toxic than the red ones but again it, it usually it just causes some gastric upset again a vine that just spreads kind of all over the place it's kind of pretty but you just want to watch mm -hmm. out for that and roll it out too if you can cut it out mm -hmm. and so Anne, you have a couple more issues you want to highlight uh, yeah this is another uh, I brought a slide of a disease called tar spot on maple and this is a disease that's showing up now mm -hmm. it's a late season it's a fungal leaf spot disease on red, Norway, and silver maple, most commonly. And it starts out early in the season. You don't really notice those spots. But as the season goes along, like about now, they look like black drops of tar. They're sort of raised and shiny. Um, since it is a late season disease, we don't worry about it too much. So you wouldn't want to go in there with a fungicide. It's not worth worrying about. But if uh, gardeners are concerned about it, they could rake up those leaves because that's where the fungus oh, okay. will overwinter and destroy those. But that's something that's showing up that usually, you know, is very noticeable. So I get a lot of calls about that. And is it harmful to the tree? Not really because it's such a late season problem. You know, the trees are already starting to shut down probably and 
So it really doesn't affect it's things. It's just more visual. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other thing was uh, powdery mildew. We are seeing powdery mildew a lot around the landscape. This is an interesting fungus disease because um, it doesn't require free moisture to infect. Most fungus diseases like six to eight hours of leaf wetness, whereas powdery mildew only likes high humidity hmm. and heat, which is exactly what we've had this summer. So these powdery mildew fungi uh, can attack a lot of different crops, lilacs. We see them on our uh, cucurbit plants right now. Um, so it's very, very common. And normally I don't say to spray a fungicide. If you have a specimen plant like the lilac, maybe you'd want to spray. There's some good organic fungicides you can use for that disease. But generally just uh, pruning things out so you let in more air and light. Um, if you're growing good flocks idea. and you have powdery mildew, you can choose some resistant flocks mm -hmm. in the future. Okay, and Leonard, the start of fall is 10 days away, and you have a book that relates to fall landscape. I do, Judy, yeah, I brought this uh, book, and um, should mention that on the website we'll give it to Ann uh, to follow up with Ann's comment with the uh, powdery mildew. I've done a lot of work over the years with that on flocks in particular, so right. people can look at some of the varieties and, and things we've done on that. But this book is Fallscaping by two well-known and very good uh, horticulture professionals, Nancy Andra and Stephanie Cohen, and um, um, this it's all about fallscaping, and these uh, professionals are very good at design too. Very good writers. It's a very fun read, and we'll just open it up here to show um, the inside and, and just example. A lot of it is about design. It starts off with a lot of the plants to plant for fall color. Um, again, like most garden references, look at the different. Um, zones to make sure it sees people from mid-Atlantic and some things mm -hmm. won't grow up here but you see a lot of good design like this says a sunny a border has a great graphic here it has the plants actually with outlines and numbers and then if we turn the page it actually tells about the different plants here so you can read about them and so you can really get a lot of great ideas um, then it has a lot of uh, other pages like grooming your gardens for winter what to do the whole back of the book is all about how to get you know what to do in the fall to get ready for winter. So Fallscaping by Andra and Cohen is a great reference for this time of year. Excellent. Now, Anne, you have something to tell us about one of my favorite herbs. Oh, yeah, basil. <laughs> yes. This is another really common problem that showed up uh, probably a month ago. It's called basil downy mildew. It's mm -hmm. different from powdery mildew. It's a different organism altogether. And on the top surface of the leaves of the basil, it just sort of looks like a nutritional deficiency. They look a little stressed. If this was early in the season, it I might say that looks a little like cold damage. Um, but if you turn the leaves upside down, and I've got the next slide on that, it, you see these dirty, dirty spores. Ooh. Yeah, so it's not very um, appetizing. No. <laughs> so you want to make all your pesto early in the season because before this disease shows up. Interesting. Because so, once it shows up, usually all the gardens get pretty infected. Is there anything but, you can do to prevent it? Not really. Not huh. really. They are thinking that it's seed borne. You know, if you spread things out, dry them out, um, control Mother Nature. That would be the good thing to do. <laughs> now, one thing that we haven't had to deal with too much up here is uh, drought situation. I know parts of Connecticut and Massachusetts, right. even New Hampshire, have been dry. I know it has been uh, dry, and a lot of times, don't be fooled, um, if we have kind of a rainy day, we may only have a tenth or two. So get a rain gauge, see what we've had. This time of year is especially crucial for both perennials being vigorous, going into winter, they'll survive better, and the woody plants, especially the evergreens. Really, you know, they can't take up water, and the leaves are there, and they're drying out in the winter. So September is a key month. Make sure they get at least an inch of rain, good soaking. So if we're Mother Nature in providing it, um, that's a good thing to do. Okay, so and if our viewers have any more questions about garden and plant problems, how can they reach you? Yeah, they can always uh, contact the Master Gardener Helpline. That's the first uh, place they should try. If um, And if the Master Gardeners can't answer the question, they'll send it on to me. But that's the first a great Line place to start. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but yes. <laughs> and Leonard, you have a website as well with information. I do, the Perry's Perennial pages, uh, perrysperennials.info, where I've got, you know, as I mentioned, some of the research we've done, like with the flocks, but a lot of articles on a lot of these topics as well. And get your gardens ready for winter. Exactly. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.